You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Today on the show is writer-director Greg Francis. Greg recently released his film, Poker Night, starring Ron Perlman, which is now available on iTunes. Greg, how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good, Dave. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you very much for coming on. I, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I heard your pod, uh, heard your interview on another podcast, and I was like, wow, this guy has a fascinating story, and I want to talk to him as well. Um <laughs> So, Greg, just to start off, could you give us uh, a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, as far as film and stuff? Uh, sure. Uh, I think probably like most kids my age, uh, when the VCR came into play, we all uh, became cinephiles. Um, I liked movies all the time as a kid, and then uh, I ended up moving to Asia my parents are actually were missionaries, and so I was living in Taiwan uh, for junior high and high school. And one year, for our tax rebate, we bought one of the very first VCRs. It was a giant, <laughs> giant machine. And uh, I just remember going down, and uh, I couldn't read any Chinese, so all the videos would be there, and I would just say, "Well, give me a comedy, or give me a horror, or give me drama or action," and then they would just give me a handful of tapes. And then just go back and watch movies all night. And that started in junior high and continues to this day, I think. Um, but never really thought that this is something that I could do. It's just something that I loved. And it wasn't until I got into college and uh, started doing theater and um, making short films that I really got excited about it. And then I thought, this is a, this sure beats working and it sure seems like fun. Let's see if we can make this go. And um, that's sort of how it all started. So now when, when you made those short films, were they, were they college projects or were they just on the side for fun? Yeah, sort of. Cause it, cause it wasn't, um, there wasn't any, uh, it, I wasn't at a school that had any kind of film program or anything like that. I think they had one or two classes, but I was in the Chicago area and they had, um, a cable access, uh, stations, which I don't even know if they exist anymore. But it was like really – it was kind of like Wayne's World where there was little studios that if you went in and took some training, you could use their equipment mm -hmm. and make shows for their TV, for their TV station. And um, so I remember using their equipment and being like, oh, we get this for free if we just want to – so we started making – it would somehow tie into a class project. But I, I remember making – two or three 30-minute projects, and then uh, I started making – at the college I went to, uh, each class would make a film and have a big night. And so I did that for the last two years too. Oh, cool. You know, I, I think there is still some kind of um, public <laughs> access left. Yeah, I'm sorry? Yeah. Is there? Yeah, I think there is. Um, sorry if I interrupted you, Greg. I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, I thought uh, I think I think there was a little lag there. Um, I apologize if I interrupted you, but uh, yeah, I think there's still a um, uh, still a little public access programs here and there across the country. There's something in Philadelphia called Philly Cam, and Comcast yeah. actually has to fund it fund this because um, uh, it was a deal that they actually struck with the city, and you can actually go there and use gear and stuff like that. And this, I mean, it, it was a great idea. And um, for people back in those days where equipment was just cost prohibitive and getting your hands on anything to make your own things was almost impossible. There's no, you know, DSLRs or anything like that. It was just so expensive and film was beyond that. But even just getting big video equipment was silly. I think there was, um, we had camcorders that had come out, but the quality is really bad. In fact, I remember doing my first shorts where it was like the old days, you would do in, in camera edits, you'd shoot. And if you didn't like the take, you'd rewind it and then do it again and rewind it and do it again. And, um, yeah, it makes me sound really old, but we were so excited just to be able to be like, Oh, we're kind of making a movie and that sort of planted the seed. 
<laughs> I, you know, I, I remember those those camcorders too growing up. Um, uh, in the nineties, uh, because I, I was born in eighty four, but I remember my my parents they got us. Uh, my parents got me a um, this this like old style VHS camera, and I remember those huge ones where you would put it on your shoulder. And it was literally like twenty pounds, and you're just like, I, can't, I need a tripod because like my shoulder's breaking here. Uh, but you know, and, and, I, and, there's, and yeah, and, there's, and then you would edit it, and you you could like you know, uh, if you got fancy, you could try to connect it to your TV through RCA, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And you get two two of them, and then try and do tape to tape and dub over like you do with your mixtapes. It was pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, eventually I got a, a TV with a VCR built in, and I connected another oh, VCR v- VCR to it, so I could actually start you know copying uh, like stuff like I could make copies of stuff I did for people, or I could like edit this together, make best ofs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it was pretty high tech for then. So you're like, this is freaking awesome, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just to have access, that was the biggest thing. I don't come from a wealthy family or or people that – I mean I was a Midwest kid and, and growing up overseas, I didn't have any connection to the industry or people in the industry. And so getting your hands on equipment for the first time was like so exciting and being able to write stuff and then make it. Um, it just was unprecedented except for doing theater. You know, It felt like, oh, we're doing something important and being able to do it for without having to pay was amazing. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like what Spike Lee once said. Um, he said the reason he went to film school was just because they had all the tools. And yeah. cause somebody asked him if they would go to film school now, and he said, "No, I wouldn't go because you know your phone is a camera now. <laughs> so you could, you know, yeah. and, and you know, cameras like you said, the DSLR and the Red and everything else. I mean, the, you have these wonderful cameras now that you could, you know, some are more expensive than others, but you can still rent some of these, you know, and you know, uh, you put together a pretty solid movie." Yeah, it's it's a completely different time now. Um, you know, film school, you can go back and forth all the time. And, and the horrible thing, of course, with any school now is it's just so ridiculously expensive. But one of the great things that does come out of film school more than the equipment or anything else is just meeting other people that want to do what you do and being able to crew up and, and get people to work on your projects and do it at, at that cost level. Um, which is hard to find other places unless there's good film groups in your city or whatever. But film school does at least give you contact with other people that are trying to do the same thing. Oh, very true. But it's expensive. Man, it's so expensive. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you know, uh, I actually went to end up going to school for business. And um, you know, when I was there, I actually was like, you know what? I, I really just want to do film. And um, I ended up Basically, the way I network is through Twitter. I mean, that's, you know, how I met you and, uh, um, yeah. you know, everything else. And, you know, and, you know, we can do things online now. Like, there's so many online film courses and, and sites now. It's like, I, I literally, Greg, I don't know about you, but I get like an invite every week to a new, like, oh, we have streaming video servers and we have webinars. And um, it's, it's amazing. It is amazing. In fact, I was scrolling through all the people that you've interviewed and I was like, holy mackerel, this guy's connected. You, you've you gotten some amazing interviews with some really good people. No idea why you'd want me on your show, but I was, I was really impressed with all the people that you've, you've had on your show. Oh, thank you very much. I, I try my best. Um, I have a, a, a ton of other people too. I've got like a, a back order, backlog of people here now, but I, I really appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. But, but Greg, you're awesome. And you know, that's why I want to have you on, um, you know, uh, and I want to talk about poker night too. Um, but I just want to real quick to go back to your background, you know, um, I, mm. you got started in, in, in the, uh, in the video world, um, you know, on your IMDb, yeah. your first credit, you know, it's paleo world and you, you know, you had, uh, you know, a couple other things, you know, how, could you talk about how you got started in, in, into, into that specific industry? Sure. Um, I got out of film school. I, I got married like two weeks before I started film school and I went to, on our honeymoon to my grandparents' house because we couldn't afford anything. I was 21 and we came back and went to film school for two years and I made a movie, um, about a 30 minute black and white sort of film noir parody. And of course it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter how many awards I won at that point. Um, so I ended up gripping for a year and PAing, and then I started art directing commercials. And about two years in, um, a guy who worked at Family Channel saw my film um, and said, "Well, I got this project I need uh, over the weekend. I need you to cut this sitcom that has a hundred episodes down to like a fifteen-minute sales tape for Mipcom, which is kind of like NAPD internationally. It's a TV sales." So I did that. And watched it was a, it, 
sorry, I probably shouldn't say that. It was a, <laughs> um, how should I say it? It was it was a tough job, but mm-hmm. we put together a good tape and it sold really well. And so then, like the next week, he goes, "All right, now I've got we're launching a game show channel, and I need a." It doesn't matter what the budget is. Um, but it was kind of like um, Princess Bride with the Dread Pirate Roberts. He would always say, um, you know, you have to do good or I can't hire you anymore. And it wasn't to put pressure on me, but just to give you the reality of if people don't like what you do, you, we can't bring you back. And so I went from cutting something to shooting a 20-minute piece on 35 with no budget. I mean, just whatever we wanted to come up with. And that sort of started about I, – I gave that about – almost a year of just doing these really big projects like that and had a good run. And during that time, uh, someone from discovery had heard about me and they brought me in and, um, asked me if I'd be interested in producing, uh, these series. And I was 24 and, um, I was doing some, you know, big producing be a really good way to expand and, um, and I was fascinated by it. There were two science shows. It was still shot on film. It was all international. So um, I jumped in and we did that for a year. And then I was, uh, you know, producing is a tough gig and I never wanted to be a producer. I was always a director. So I would argue with the EP all the time. Well, really, I want to be directing. But sometimes you get too valuable at one thing and they don't want you to do something else. So finally, at the end of that year, I quit. And um, when we finished the seasons and then they hired me back as a director and I started, I sort of rode the, right after that, um, about 96 was the OJ trial. And that was when the first crime shows went on discovery and um, our company did those. So it grew from about nine people to about 200 people. And we were doing five, six shows at a time and had a big studio and just running, running act. But I rode that horse for a long time. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm still doing crime shows. Um, but it was fascinating and fun. And I was traveling all over the country, meeting with different cops and then coming back and getting actors and redoing, you know, the murders and the, and the stories. And so it was a great education of, you know, showing up and having to do 10, 15 pages a day or, you know, running around, um, just creating stuff as you went. And, um, it was it, it was the best film school I ever could have had, and I really learned a lot. So, so when when they were when you were producing and they and you you mentioned that when you become so good at something they don't want you to do something else, you know, like what, what were some of the challenges you you would face, uh, you know, or some of the biggest challenges you fa- you uh, had to face as a producer? Well, it's all hard. Uh, I mean, I. And into something different. You know, I'd produce big commercial things where we had money, discovery, we were on um, more of a limited budget, and plus it was international. So there was a lot of, and these were as close to pure documentary as everything that I've done. So, you know, we were working with Archaeology Magazine, and I'd send a crew out into the field, and they might go over to Petra in Jordan. And, um, I sent them over there because we think there's a dig about one thing and they get over there and that story sucks and they change the story completely, but they're gone for seven days at a place with no, this is before cell phones or pagers and, and they're out in the field. And I, I don't know until the day they come back to the airport and they call me and say, Oh, we changed everything. It's a whole new story. Everything you sent us over here to do is wrong. And so then you come back and have to put that together. And so there was a lot of that, you know, and, and just trying to keep people safe. You know, uh, we were, we had crews, in some hot spots, uh, people just flying everywhere, just trying to manage all that and learn, and then uh, come back and put it together into a story that makes sense. So it was a great experience um, and a lot of learning on the fly. Um, but at the same time, you know, I wanted to. There were two or three shows that I took myself, you know, going over to China and doing stuff there. Um, and that's more what I wanted. I wanted to be out in the field. I didn't want to be sitting in the office or sitting in the edit suite as much as I wanted to be out doing it. So, so as you went through the years of this, eventually, you know, you, you decided you wanted, you wanted to actually make feature films, correct? I think the goal was always to make feature films. Um, that was why I went to school and that's what you want to do. And 
you know, at that time in the early 90s, it still seemed, you know, this was the Spike Lee era, the Kevin Smith era, um, all my heroes, Robert Rodriguez, these are guys that are out doing it. Uh, Taren, like, man, why? Right project at the right time. They were, you know, this this town's tough, and so you have to work your way up. And I think I was, I was married and had kids coming by this point, and was doing really well in TV. Where you know I was, I was just working all the time, and so it was always a struggle with me. To, you know, do you keep riding this horse, or do you quit and leave and try and try and go out there and do what you wanted to do? Um, and that's finally, eventually, where I got got to where I wrote Poker Night and started down that road. Oh, so so when you wrote Poker Night, you know, could you take us through the process of how you actually started to write it? I mean, did, did you outline heavily or uh, did or you know, did you do a lot of treatments or did you just dive right in and just sort of find your way out, so to speak? Sorry, Greg, are you there? Uh Hey, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm kind of processing it. Oh, sorry. I'm laughing at myself. <laughs> the, I think what really separates a lot of amateurs from professionals, and certainly for me, I've written all my life, but I'm, I'm a very undisciplined writer. Uh, I love writing. I love reading. Well, let me rephrase it. I love reading and I love stories. Um, but, you know, sitting down and really uh, being disciplined every day, I'm not great at I, I was doing so much time with um, homicide detectives all over the country, um, interviewing them all day and then going out with them at night and hearing all the. Thirty pages of poker night, I just kicked out in like a day and then it sat there for about four months and um I didn't know what to do with it. I had a friend come in and I would tell him the story. And so Doug and I would talk about it. He's, he's credited uh, with story with me on the, on the film and he helped me break it and um, talk about different things. And then, and then over the next basically 10 years, it was a lot of rewrites and changes. And um, as, as things would switch, we would rewrite and, and it continued all the way up to when we were on set finally 10 years later. So when you were writing, do you ever subscribe to the eight sequence method or do you know, or, you know, <laughs> anything like that? Or do you just, no, you know, throw that aside? I think the only book that I had, cause I took script writing in, in film school in grad school and loved the class, loved the teacher, um, and wrote a bunch, but I think we had Sid Field's book and there really, it wasn't really a cottage industry like it is today. Um, where there's all these other things, you know, story didn't exist then none of the other things existed. Um, and I kind of was just plotting in the dark. Um, and then it became, uh, well, if I have three acts, I can have three different stories at the table and then he tries to escape three times. And so that's kind of how I built the structure of the film. And then we got to the end and it sat there for, another two, three months. Cause I didn't know, I never had the ending and didn't know what it was, um, or how to, how to pull it all back together. Um, and then finally that came and then it changed again once we got, uh, to production. So, um, I, it would be great to say that I was smart and had it all plotted out and figured out. Um, and you know, you go back and forth too, if you write a lot, what's better to really know everything that you're doing. It's certainly easier in one sense. And it certainly, makes it more achievable. Um, but there's something nice about being surprised by the characters and being inspired as you go too. It's just, it's a lot harder. <laughs> it's a lot harder. So. Yeah, I know what you mean. I've actually tried, uh, like both methods myself and sometimes when I'm writing and just, you know, you sort of just get a starting point and you have no plan where this is going and you just sort of say, Hey, you just see where the characters are going to take me. And you know, it is, you know, sometimes you're like, Oh wow, that happened. Holy crap. You know, yep. uh, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see that one coming, but, uh, you know, once you can get into that flow, so to speak, uh, you know, that's that sweet spot that all these, all writers, you know, uh, talk about it's, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's the one thing you wish you could turn on or off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It's, it's, it's so tough. I, you know, anyone that's a writer, I, I have so much uh, sympathy uh, for, cause it's, it's a tough life and it's a very tricky thing. And um, to be disciplined and also to have something interesting and keep people interested. Um, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, I, I need, I, I hope to keep getting a lot better at it. I need to get a lot better at it. <laughs> have, uh, have you read the, uh, the book, the, uh, the war of art? Yeah. It's a great book. Yeah. It, it's, right. it's astounding. I always, every writer I always, uh, who comes on, I always talk about that with them, uh, just to see if they've read that, because that is, in my opinion, you know, like the de facto, if you're going to start at like a novel or a screenplay, you should just sit down and read this first. And yeah, exactly. you know, this is what you're going to be in for. <laughs> It's, it's funny because, you know, now it's like I said, it is such an industry. Um, and I've read I think I've read every book. I, I have this weird thing I subscribe subscribe to that if if I learn one thing from a book, it's worthwhile now, since I love reading. But it's also it's a great way to avoid writing is I, I think I have every book on writing and I'll sit and read that instead of writing. So <laughs> it's tough. Um and I don't know that any more that necessarily they help. One of the best things I ever heard from a guy out here on screenwriting was, is the only thing that matters is if when I get to the bottom of the page, do I want to read the next page and everything else doesn't really matter. And I think that's really the truth of, of what a good screenplay is. Yeah, and that's very true. You know, so, so as you took, um, you know, poker night, and, and you have the finished screenplay, uh, you know, w what was your next step in, in, in you know, getting it out there and, and, and steps to get it made? That's another great question. Um, you know, it's one of those that there were a few things before that that um, I got really inspired by, besides all of the great indie films. Um, there was um, Wayne Wang did this movie called um, Smoke uh, back – back in the early nineties. And it, it was about a cigar shop in Brooklyn and had a lot of big names in it. And while they were filming, they, they were enjoying themselves so much. They shot another film called blue, blue in the face, I think. Um, and just kept bringing people in and they improv a whole nother movie. And I was like, man, people are just doing it. Why can't we do it? So we tried a few things writing and putting things together to get to that point where I was like, we could do something kind of cheap, but it never came together. Poker night was the first thing I felt like, all right, this, you know, this is something that has, has a genre feel to it. And I think we could get the money. And at that point, obviously blockbuster was still huge. And you're like, at least someone will pick it up at blockbuster. Um, so I put it together and I thought the only thing that I don't know is, you know, how to get the money. And, uh, so I was talking with friends and, uh, my sister lived in a place where there were some people with money and her husband owned a restaurant and he said, well, why don't you come out and I'll introduce you to some people and I'll, you know, you guys can eat for free. And that's kind of how it started. I would go in and just pitch these rich people. And eventually we, we got about a million dollars and I thought we were going to make the movie. So we we packed up and moved, moved to that town. Um, and then we still had to get another million dollars. So that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt like, well, you've already got a million. How hard can it be? And it came together pretty fast. So, but it proved to be harder than I thought. <laughs> so w when you got that first million, you know, with the, with the pitch, did, you know, did the investors ask a lot about like, you know, ROI or did they, did they want to see like a physical packet? Cause I mean, at that point, you know, probably, you know, digital packets are, are big now, but I mean, at that point, you know, physical packets are probably still in vogue. So did they ask to see any of that? We, not really. We, we had a, um, a, a pretty nice business plan. Uh, similar to what everyone else is going to put out. You know, you lay out, here's some similar films, here's how they performed, uh, a big statement up front about risk and how much money you need to have in the bank if you even want to consider an investment like this, um, what the rate of return could be, how, how profit from film is divided, um, a lot of background on all the people that were involved, um, and, and then we did have a DVD that had, uh, a little video pitch. It had a little teaser on it and, um, some more information, but truthfully, the people that I was talking to, I don't think they cared one bit. 
Um, most of them were very, very wealthy. Um, and I, when, cause I went back to them and tried to, once, once we had the million and I was hitting a couple walls, I'm like, why don't you guys just double your investment? And they were like, we look, we never expected to see this money again. And we like you and we liked, uh, we wanted to invest in you. And so go out and get the rest and see if you can make it. Um, but it wasn't like they were looking at this as, boy, this would be a great way to return the money. I think mostly they were also just, you know, part of it is it's a sexy business. And I think they were interested in that. And, um, and a lot of these guys were venture capitalists themselves who started with nothing and had some people bet on them and became incredibly wealthy. So I think, you know, it was like a long shot thing that wasn't going to hurt them too much. And they were amused by me, <laughs> probably <laughs> truthfully. <laughs> Uh, you know, I once read an article uh, about a f from a filmmaker who said there are uh, uh, other methods of ROI, and what he meant was uh, basically his he had one financier, and that was a billionaire's wife. And this wife just liked to tell people that she was a movie producer. And whenever he had a movie, you know, she would write a check, and here you go. And so when they when they would go to like you know yacht parties or whatever else, hey, uh, you know my wife, this is my wife, a uh, film producer. So that's how they got ROI. That's how her that's ROI. So funny. Yeah, yeah. People are are really funny, and it's a tough thing because anyone, as anyone in this business knows, it's it's a really tricky thing to return money on investment, especially now, I think it's harder than ever. Um, you have to be very creative about it. And I think there are people that are coming up with some really interesting ways, but the business has changed so much, I think in the last three years, even. Um, so it, 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 it's a dicey thing, especially if you're trying to go it alone. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you know, just as a food for thought, Greg, you know, I, I don't know what your next project is, not to jump too far in the conversation, but, mm. you know, have you ever thought about crowdfunding for your next project? Yeah, uh, I have. I think that it's it's a great, great source. Um, it's, you know, getting I think getting the, the people in the following, I, I think now maybe with a project behind me and people a little bit more aware, at least some fans of the project, I think that that would be easier. Um, at the time, I certainly didn't think so. Mm -hmm. um, but now I think, you know, that's definitely something to look at. So, um, you know, so now, that, you know, eventually you did get the the two million or so to make Poker Night. You know, how, how did you go about, you know, building a team from there? I um, mean, did you already have producers on board or did you wait until after you got the money to, to start like crewing up with like a director of cinematography and, and you know, all the other key roles? Well, it was a long process from there. Um, and all those in, initial investors were, are not involved with the project as it is now. Um, there was a point where after we had the money and um, I came out and met some people out here that were very shady in L.A. and still didn't have a good feel for it. There was a producer that was a line producer at the time um, who was just starting to make bigger movies, and he loved it. And very quickly, he got the script to – he was shooting a film in Ireland or Isle of Man with um, James Franco and um, Kevin Reynolds, who directed Waterworld, <laughs> um, called Tristan and His Old. And the guy that was the, the second unit director, swordsman on the film, uh, stunt coordinator – also did Star Wars. And for whatever reason, he loved the script and he got it to Sam Jackson and he got it to Hayden Christensen and they both wanted to make the movie. And all of a sudden it became uh, a big project and um, they didn't want me to direct. And I debated with him a long time and finally stepped down and stayed on as a producer. And we got picked up by three companies right away and a lot of, a lot of fighting and a lot of phone calls for about a year and a half. I was on the phone every day with all these different people and it suddenly became something. And we finally ended up at icon films, Mel Gibson's company, and it was going to be a $10 million film. And that was set for August, 2006. And it was about a year leading up to that of just trying to get Sam and Hayden's schedules clear and getting everybody in the right place. 
And at that point, then they uh, got offered Jumper with Doug Lyman, which was, I think, a hundred and hundred and ten million dollar film. They both were probably making more than our budget, our whole budget. And they left. And so the, after two years, it sort of fell apart. They gave me a couple names that I could try and get to keep the project alive. But I was at a point where I needed to make some money because um, it, it was a long road to do that. And so I just dropped the project and went and started directing skincare commercials in overseas and then uh, here in the States and did that for about four years. And during that time, it, the project was optioned three or four more times and set up at different places and almost a go and um, had lots of meetings as a writer, none as a director. And finally, uh, I just kind of uh, stopped giving the option. I didn't want people to, to take it unless uh, they would let me direct it. And so that went on for another year or so. And then uh, finally, uh, the producer I have now came in and he'd been bugging me over the years and knew of the script from the first, first incarnation back in like 2004. And he's like, we're going to make your movie this year. And I was like, I don't believe you. And uh, then we went and did it. So it, it just took a long time to get there. And as far as putting the team together, um, there wasn't anybody left from when I started no one and so it's all new mm -hmm. i took two people we shot in canada and the only people that came up with me was um a young lady who started as a pa for me and is now a big commercial producer and just produced her first film and uh the dp and i actually had a different dp up until two weeks before the film who i shot a lot of uh commercials with and he was just breaking into film uh, he, well, he wasn't just breaking, but he had done a lot of small films and was getting bigger films, uh, and did a really nice horror film that year that was big and was ready to do it. And we, we pushed a week and he thought the film wasn't going to go and he took a different job. So I had to find a new DP in a week. And, um, and so I found Brandon and man, he did a great job for me and we really clicked right away and it worked out really well. So, so did you find that your your experience as a producer? So, when like a fire like that breaks out with it, you know, your DP, you know, has to leave a week before that you were able to find one so quickly. Uh, you know, do you, is that, did you think your producer experience helped with that? Yeah, I mean, anyone who, regardless of, I guess, where you end up in these positions, you know, the reason I got that producing job in the first place was because I was producing all the stuff I was directing, and then anything that I've done outside of Discovery, like I've done two series in China, uh, a lot of commercials, all the the skincare stuff for four years, I'm producing and directing all of that. So it's not that I've ever stepped away from it. And I think you also end up in, you want to control as much as possible just so that you have the things that you need. And um, so none of those things uh, stood in my way, I would say, in the sense of, it did. It, it bothers you, but you're just like, well, we've got to make this happen, and so you keep going, because otherwise, man, you'll fall apart because everything burns to the ground pretty fast, um, and there's crises every day. So you just get get tough and and keep pushing through and don't let it stop you. Yeah, yeah, and that's very true, uh, Greg. Because I, you know, there's, you know, I, I've done stuff myself, and you like, you know, you always sort of end up, you know, realizing those short films that you did, or you know, student films, whatever. That, you know, those always end up teaching you. You have to have like a plan A through Z, because yeah. plan A is going to fall. Uh, very rarely does play, plan A ever work out, and then you got to, you know, and then going down the steps now, uh, to, to we actually get something that actually ends up like, you know, like you with Poker Night until it ends up actually happening, and everyone's on set, and you're like, all right, here we go, let's film this. <laughs> it is. It, it, I used to tell people, you know, because what am I? Forty. I'm forty seven. So I started when I was twenty, twenty one, twenty two. And you're like, in all those years, I feel like I've failed so many times at so many things, and the reason that you get paid better as you get older is because you don't fail the same way. And so it's like, I've seen all those problems happen in 20 years, 25 years. And I I know I'm not going to have that same problem. I'm going to have new problems and I'm going to make new mistakes, 
but I better not make the same ones that I made before because it's the business is just it costs too much money. <laughs> so I think you know experience really does teach you, and those hard lessons that you learn on all the hard projects only make you stronger and better when you come to a new project. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, you, you know, like something I've learned is that uh, over the years is that storyboarding is so key. Um, I know some directors don't storyboard, but that's something that I've learned that really helps not only you visualize the, mo the movie, but so sort of it helps everybody else as well. I've heard that. I've heard rumors of that. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great story about uh, Matt Damon going to work with the Coen brothers on um, True Grit. And he, he said he wanted to take the job because I forget who was telling him. It might have been, I think it was Brad Pitt said, you know, the great thing with working with the Coen brothers is every day you get your sides, which is, you know, the piece of the script you're shooting that day. And next to your sides is the storyboard of every shot they're going to do. So you know exactly what you're doing in every single scene. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. And I remember um, getting to hear M. Emmett Walsh talk when I was uh, in, in film school about Blood Simple. Mm -hmm. And he, it was the Coen brothers first film. And, and he had a great story about uh, he had this idea when he gets shot and he falls in the bathroom, how he wanted to do it. And he said the Coen brothers kept showing him the, the storyboards and going, no, but look, this is how you fall. And he goes, yeah, but I thought of it. And they said, no, 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 this is how you fall. And so I always think of that because I love them. They're brilliant. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I don't know that my drawing skills are good enough for uh, – for storyboarding. And sometimes I'm also, I, I don't know, people are all funny, but you're like, I don't know if I want everybody to know because it changes so fast. And as soon as you put it on paper, they're like, but this is what you're supposed to do. And I think doing so much TV and so much, um, so many things that change so quickly, uh, I end up being a lot more fluid on set from what I plan. So. I mean, that, that's a great story about Emma Walsh. Um, you know, Blood Simple. Um, you know, I've watched that movie you know a dozen times. You know, I think that's a very good, almost a film school in itself, because yeah, totally. it, it, it's 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 very good. And they you could tell they you know they didn't have a lot of money, but they used the story to just you know, hey, look, we don't have, we can't blow up a car, this and that. Because uh, I remember uh, the interview they did for Raising Arizona, they said they finally got to blow up a car, which they always <laughs> wanted to do. And they, they couldn't do that in Blood Simple or or Crime Wave or um, I forget, uh, second movie. I forget what it was, but uh, you know it was. <laughs> But as you get better, you know, like you said, not only do you get paid better for not making the same mistakes, but you get to blow up a car. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you have to dream bigger. <laughs> uh, you know, Greg, just to you know, sort of take a step back. You know, when you were talking about you know in LA and talking about producing and and uh, you know going out and finding some really shady people, is there any you know just sort of tips that you could parlay to people that about you know what to look out for if they ever, you know, get someone trying to give them a, you know, a deal, whether it's a distribution deal or, you know, a, um, an actual investment deal. Boy, it, it's difficult because, um, as the creative, you know, you're willing in some ways to almost do anything to get your movie made. And, and so when people are offering you things, uh, it, it takes a lot of discernment to know, is this a good offer? Is this a bad offer? How do I, and, and truthfully, when you're starting out, you don't really have a lot of choices. Um, but I did feel because I had raised that initial investment that I was sort of a caretaker of that. And a lot of a lot of the guys that wanted to invest or to work with that money, I just didn't trust even uh, having the money that I raised. I, di I didn't feel like you could just tell. And then, you know, then you sort of learn, well, that's how they all are. It's not necessarily just these guys. <laughs> but um, and, and then, you know, over the next 10 years, I go back and forth a lot. Well, you know, if I would have said yes, then at least the movie's done, you know, or maybe it just should never happen. And so I, it's a cautionary tale on both sides, because at a certain point, you just want to get it done regardless but you also don't want to have to go back to the people that believed in you and trusted in you and say, these guys took us all for a ride. Um, I think once I finally came to a producer who was putting up the money and, and staying on board, um, it was a different situation. And 
So it took, it took 10 years to get to the right situation. I hope it won't be 10 years for the next one. Um, but I would say, use your, use your judgment. And, and then sometimes, you know, you look at some of the great filmmakers, John Sayles, uh, James Cameron, um, they all, you know, these guys that started with Corman and some of the other things, it wasn't ever the best situation. Their first films are, you know, they show promise, but they're not great. Um, and sometimes you just have to roll the dice and, and go for it and know that it's, it's not going to work always in your favor. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson was the same thing with Reicher, uh, with Hard Eight. Um, and then, and then you hope that you had enough goodwill off that project to get another one. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. I wish that I had better advice, but no. trust your gut, trust your gut. Well, no, I think that's great advice. Um, but you know, and you're right. You, you sort of parlay the, the, you know, one movie to the next. And, uh, and I don't think you would have to wait another 10 years to make something after poker nights, because I think, you know, uh, you, you, you've got distribution on iTunes right now. Um, you know, the movie's doing, I, I see all the time people are tweeting at you about the movie. Um, you know, I, I really think that, you know, and maybe like we talked about earlier with crowdfunding, I think, you know, when you do have your next script, I think you can sort of expedite the whole process now. Well, your mouth to God's ears. I, I, w- I would love to be able to get another shot at the plate. Um, it, it, we, we've had a good reception. It, it's been fun to see. You know, there's definitely a lot of haters too. Um, but uh, it, the people that are looking for something like it, I think, like it. Mm-hmm. So that was that was why we, we tried to do it in the first place, was just to come up with something that's the same but different, uh, in the same realm but different. Um and and have fun with it, and that's what we tried to do. So I think it connects with certain people, and other people <laughs> have no patience for it. So I understand that too. <laughs> uh, so you know, you know, and speaking of you know, actually you know, making the films, you know, could you take us back to how did you actually cast Ron Perlman in, in Poker Nights? You know, uh, you know, how did you go about contacting him and eventually casting him in the movie? Well, you know, I wish there were more romantic stories about this kind of thing, but um, the casting process is a very difficult thing. And and I was, you know, coming out of TV, it's different because people want to work and I'm not working with high level actors on the shows that I do. It's, it's mostly new actors. Um, So it's, it's very easy to get lots of auditions and go through the auditions and make people audition again and find the right person for the role for this um, we knew we needed uh, to get good actors, and we had a casting director, Chadwick Strzok, who's really great, um, and and goes back and forth between, you know, some low budget stuff to better budget stuff. He works a lot with Kevin Spacey's company, and um, he just is a really great guy. But any of these movies, they're hard to get because there isn't a lot of money, and um, you're you're just sort of throwing thrown it against the wall until you get somebody to say yes. I think with Poker Night, on the page, it could go either way. You don't know if it's going to be, you know, a gory slasher film or if it's going to be or play to the more smart parts of the script. So getting people to read it and getting offers out that people were interested in, it took a while. Um, I remember, and I was hitting every character actor I could. I, I just had, I had lists of 50, 60 names of the best in the business that I loved. And we just, you know, couldn't get responses a lot of time. And so you go through, you make an offer and, uh, it's a timed offer usually. So it'll be X amount of money against X number of days. And we need you to respond by next week. And you never, even though they're required by law to make, give them the offer, you never know if they do, you don't know what's going on. And I was looking for older guys. So some of these guys are like, I'd rather be out in my boat fishing or whatever. So you, you never know the truth of if they even read the script or saw the script. And so we kept just making offer after offer after offer. And and we went back and forth too, because you're like, well, do you get Jeter first or do you, do you get the young guy first or do you get the old guys at the table? And which is going to help the other? And I always wanted to go for the older guys because those are the guys that excite me anyway. But there was a lot of thought that maybe we should get the lead first because if we get the right lead, it'll help position the film to the older guys. And eventually... Uh, it didn't matter. It would be a lot of rejection. I, I want to say it might have almost even been a month. And some people would, you know, it wasn't really a rejection. It would be the offer runs out and you don't know what's happening. Um, but truthfully, we got um, 
one actor who said yes. And as soon as he said yes, we filled up all the roles like super fast. In fact, one of the things that I would recommend and I've heard other people do is that you can make a contingency offer because a lot, a lot of, a lot of these lower budget films, you're, you're doing favored nations. You know what that is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, everyone's getting kind of the similar offer, but, uh, I did hear after that, you know, you can, that there is a thing called like first in bonus because sometimes it's just getting that name to make it a legitimate prog, prog, uh, project. So as soon as you have somebody that means something, all of a sudden it means something. And then everyone else is in a, as afraid. So maybe there's a, you know, five grand, I don't know, five grand is ridiculous. I don't even know what the number would be, but there's a bonus for the guy that signs first because then it, everyone else came in. And literally, I think once we had that first name, we, we had everybody within two weeks and Perlman was a guy that, you know, I, I've loved forever. I've loved since quest for fire and really wanted him in and, and, um, he's funny cause we did the Q and a out here at the premiere in LA and I was telling this story and he was like, well, you know, because, uh, he wanted to play a certain role and I had three old guys at the table and, and the guy that Proman plays, I always imagined as like a 40 year old guy. I wanted one guy in between our young guy and the old guys. And so Perlman really wanted to play that part. And um, I kept going, he's better for the other part. I want him as one of the older guys so I can get a younger guy, you know, like a, these are, you know, like a Mark Ruffalo. Uh, that's a dream cast or, a, you know, even a John Cusack. Some of these guys that are really great that could sort of bridge that gap. And the word kept coming back, nope, this is the one he wants to play. And when I told the story, Ron was like, well, if I would have known you felt that way, I never would have pushed for it. And I'm like, no, you it doesn't make any difference what I thought because Perlman's great. And actually the producer said to me, are you really want to tell Ron Perlman? No, is that what you want to do? You, you don't want him in the project just because you think that this role should be this way. And it was a really dumb thing. So, uh, I was like, no, you're right. I'm an idiot. And, uh, one of many times. Um, and so I sort of, I, I don't even, I didn't even rewrite it. We just changed it and gave it to Ron and my gosh, he's, He's the shining light in the film. He's amazing. And he knocked it out of the park. I think he felt like, well, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have ever taken this role if it was that, but I'm like, man, it's the best thing in the world that he took this role. It's the best thing in the world. The producer talked to me out of my foolishness and, and he, and he shines on the screen. He's amazing. In fact, we got so lucky with all the actors. I can't, uh, I, I couldn't even imagine that we would get a cast like that. Um, these guys are all brilliant. And I mostly just had to sort of stay out of their way and let them do their thing and learn, watch and learn a lot. Just like poker night. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's that old saying when, when you have a, a great script, uh, you know, that's like half of the work done for the director right there. So, you know, because you can always, uh, you know, d uh, go from that. You know, all the actors can go from their, their actions, their dialogue, the subtext, and then. They said, it, you know, having a great DP is like the other, you know, 20 some percent. And they said, you know, there's just like 10 percent left where you, the, the directors it's up to the director to screw it up. Uh, <laughs> have you ever heard that, Greg? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I think there's a lot of truth to that. I, um, over the years of doing it, I've, I've really learned to sort of step back and, and let let people do their jobs. And, and and I mean, you get the credit anyway, unless they're really screwing up. Uh, people still say nice things about me, but my gosh, the crew we had, the DP I have, Brandon Cox, the actors I have, you know, the, the things that are messed up in the movie are my fault. Um, and the things that work, uh, I really, the credit belongs to everyone that was up there. The Canadian crew was unbelievable. Um, I just felt really lucky and really blessed with the people I got to work with. So do you have any other, you know, tips uh, for directing actors that you've, uh, you know, if you accumulated over the years? Boy, every, everybody's different. And, you know, you work with somebody, each one of them was different. Um, Ron was very specific. And if I gave him a note on a line, you could bet that that line would change. Um, he, he was very, I, I, I was afraid there's um, a couple of John Badham books on directing. I don't know if you've seen those. Um, I think it's like, I'll be in my trailer and I forget what the next one is. 
And it was all these stories of him working with big actors and all the problems. And he, and he collected them from generations, you know, stuff with Steve McQueen and with other people where just directors and actors clash. And so it wasn't that I read that and was like, oh, I'm scared. But I was very nervous going in of, you know, who's this guy that's done all this TV? And, you know, we know what we're doing. We've done 200 movies. And, and it's true, they all had. Um, I think knowing that I wrote the script and they all had a lot of respect for the script um, gave me more cachet. So th there was never a time when uh, anybody got grumpy with me or, or, or rude to me or said, shut up, or you don't know what you're doing. They were all very, very good. Um, but at the same time, I feel like I'm not an overbearing director. Um, I've learned over the years, one of the things that I usually do, and this is from poker night, even to my uh, crime shows, is I sit, I sort of set up the scene. This is what's happening. Here's your blocking. And then let them do the scene the way that they've prepped it because it could be way better than anything that I thought or that I would direct them to do. And so when you see it the first time, you, you're just like the audience going, wow, this could be amazing. And then if it sucks or it's bad, then you can come in and, and start leading people a certain way. But I usually don't try, I mean, on poker night, we didn't get to have rehearsal beforehand. You know, we, we're just thrown right into it. In fact, oh, yeah, remind me, I'll go back and tell you one more casting story. Um, but it, I, I tend to step back and see what people are going to bring to the project first and then go from there. Um, but with these guys, they're all, I, I mean, what could I tell them? You know, these guys are all veteran actors, character actors who've been shooting hundreds of movies. And uh, I'm just the guy for this one. But, you know, they treated me with respect. They listened to everything that I said. They changed things. They would, if they felt I was leading them a the wrong way, we would talk about that. Ron and I, on our very first take, uh, I was trying to do something that I thought was helpful. And he sort of was like, well, I think the script, you know, is this way. And, and it was really good. So they kept me in line too. And I, I, like anything, you know, you learn, learn from the best. They were amazing. Um, and that's just being patient. And I love actors. I, I, I started as, I started in theater. I would never necessarily say I was an actor, but um, it's so much fun to have people come to life and bring something to life that you did and to get to work with these guys and, and have a process to allow them to relax and do their best work. Um, that's something I cherish and really enjoy. So it, it was so much fun. You, you know, um, you mentioned having a big actor and you were kind of scared because, you know, sometimes they might be, you know, used to a certain thing or a certain, a certain way. Um, I actually had a, you know, just to, you know, just to, uh, compliment that story. I, I have a friend of mine and, um, he was shooting a movie here in, in PA and he shot at Eastern state penitentiary and, uh, the actor, was notorious for just going off on the director at random times, and um, he was relieved at the end because they didn't have a fight at all. They they actually got along well, and he he at the you know as as they were leaving for the day, he came up to him and he's like, yeah, you know, it's amazing we got along and and everything. And the guy said, yeah, well I'll see you tomorrow. And he said, no no no, we're we're done. The movie's over. And he's like. What the what the fuck do you mean the movie's <laughs> over? And he, and he goes, well, that was it. We got every all the footage and we we're, we're all good. And he goes, what the fuck? And and he said he just lost it for no reason for for <laughs> telling him the movie was done. I guess. <laughs> and um, so uh, yeah, you know, but but you're right though, you know, uh, you know, I I would still there's certain actors that I would just love to work with, but I'm always you know hesitant because you know there's different experience levels and there's different expectations and you know and some people just have bad days you know um, yeah so you just got to sort of ride the storm and see you know where that takes you right yeah and you know i don't know everyone has a different approach i've been doing it a long time but at at that level and the way that those guys probably saw me not at their level um but i'm also i, I come in pretty it's not hat in hand but i you know i don't feel any need to throw down some kind of, you know, I'm, I'm the guy in charge and this is how we're going to do it. And you're on my train. I'm no David Fincher. I'm no James Cameron. I don't, uh, that's not my skill set yet. 
<laughs> I'm I'm just a guy that wrote a script and I'm happy to be here and ecstatic to be working with you guys. And so, you know, I was very, I, I talked to each of them to say, well, this will feed into that casting story. So part of making these offers is, you know, you hear all the time, well, I went and met with this guy and we talked about if this, if they would be right for the part and how they saw things. Well, on this level of filmmaking, you don't, I mean, I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. The agents refused to allow me to have a conversation, to even be like, well, are they right for this? Do they hate this script? Have they read the script? Do they have, do they decide they want to play it in a dress? You know, I don't get any feel at all other than their body of work and how amazing they seem to be um, because they don't, you know, Perlman might get on the phone with me and all of a sudden think I'm a good guy and then say, well, you know, tell his agent, make the deal. I don't care what it is. I want to work with him or the opposite. He might say, forget it. I don't want to do it. And the agents are already not happy because you're taking their actor on a small film mm -hmm. and that's time that they can't be making money on a big film. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a hard process to get in. And it wasn't until they accept the offer that then I get a, a phone number and I can call them. So now they're already in the movie. I don't know if they like me, if they like the script, if we can work together, any of it. So it's a scary call. And you have to get on the phone and say, hey, I hope you liked everything. Let's get to know each other. Um, what, how do you, what's your take on this character? And it's all after the fact. So it's a really, um, I mean, I was in amazing hands. I, it wasn't like I was going to somebody that's never done anything and all of a sudden they're hired. And it wasn't some, none of these guys had a reputation of being, you know, crazy or anything. They're all brilliant actors, but it's still that feeling of, uh, it's the cart before the horse a little bit that we can't even have a chance to make sure we can get along because some people you just don't get along with. So it was a very frightening thing, but e with each of them, I was very clear, look, you know, I've done TV, I've done a film. Uh, I did write this. This is how I see things. If you have a process different than what my process is, Tell me the best way that I can help you. Um, you know, this is how I approach it. How do you approach it? Uh, I know Ron Eldard was one that he told me right away. He's like, look, you don't have to come in and play any kind of games with me. I don't need to know, you know, think about this or think about that. You just tell me exactly what you want. Say it faster. Say what you want. Uh, I think you should be angry here. Um, I don't like how you said that word. He wanted me to be very specific and not waste time on trying to manage him or direct him in a, in a different way. Cause you know how it is. You'll be like, well, you know, I was thinking, you know, you've had this part and you've come in here and you're trying to set the scene to get him to a way that you want him to be. And he was just like, just tell me exactly it. And there was another actor on set that was unbelievable uh, in a smaller part, Lachlan Monroe. He played the um, serial killing photographer. And uh, he, he's been on so many sets and done, he was in unforgiven. He's been in the the, a lot of the Wayne brothers movies and he could tell the cameraman every time he would cross behind the actor. Okay. I'm getting ready to bring out the knife on one, two, three. And then, the, you know, he was like directing the cameras. But they never missed any parts of his performance in the middle of his performance. I'd never seen that. Um, and he was brilliant in the film. So there was a lot of, everyone has a different process and you sort of start learning, but uh, I think the best thing you can be, at least for me on the first film, was to be very flexible and fluid, um, especially because, I mean, these are top, top actors. They're not, you know, the money makers that a Tom Cruise is, but man, they can just act circles around so many of our big celebrities. They're just really, really good. Yeah, it's also sort of like what Dov uh, S.S. Simon says in his book, you know, from Real to Deal, he always recommend saying to actors, why don't we try it this way? Yeah, they were totally open to everything. There was one, there was only one time that, um, that one of the actors was like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and it was a pretty funny thing. I asked him to do something that was a little bit crazy. And he was like, I'm not doing that. And then the next day he told me, I really should have done that, which, you know, they, they, they're masters at games too. all those guys. And so they were directing me as much as I was directing them. You know, uh, I, I once, you know, uh, uh, was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Gary King, who I'm hoping to have on the podcast. And he said one thing he learned while making all the student films and short films was that 
you have to take – after each take, direct the actors in a certain way. That way when you go to edit, you have different things to choose from because he used to have actors basically do scenes uh, – I'm sorry, each each take of a scene the exact same way. And then when he was editing, he's like, man, I got nothing really to choose from. It's you know, it's either take one where she says it like this or take two where she says it exactly the same way, you know? Yeah, I can see that. I mm-hmm. think um, – I can see that. I don't know that I've ever done that. Mm -hmm. Um, Partly, I feel like uh, you're heading down a path that you know where you want to get to and you can feel it when it's there. Mm -hmm. And even just to get what you want correct uh, takes takes some time. So, you know, it might take three, four takes to get it where you want it and then you want to get it right. Um, if they were doing something different every single time, partly, I mean, I, I think it depends too on the kind of director you are. If you're making your show more in the edit room or if you're uh, locking in on set uh, to what you're going to do in the edit room. Um, I, and I, I, I do, I, I would say I would subscribe more to it if I feel like we've really knocked it out of the park uh, on the first set of coverage. Well, let's try something different on this one uh, and, and do one or two takes that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's tough when, when you don't have a lot of time and you're moving fast on a low budget film, uh, to have, cause then you're going well on your wide shot. If you do five different versions, then you're going to go to your over or your medium shot. Now you got to do five different versions and they better match the first five versions. And then your close up, those all better match those first five and how delineated are those five. So, um, I think that it can work and especially maybe on a comedy, um, I could see that a lot more because there's a lot more room for that. Um, but I've, I haven't done too much that way. I think that it's an interesting idea. Um, and if you have all the, if you have a lot of time, I think it'd be a great thing to explore. I just, I, I guess I haven't had that luxury yet. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. It would definitely work better on a comedy because that way you could yeah. at least have that juxtaposition of like, you know, he's supposed to say this, but he's angry and it's, right, it's right, you right. know, stuff like that. So, yeah, I, 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 you know, I see exactly what you mean. And, you know, um, but, you know, uh, you know it, a lot of this would always come up with is food for thought. And it's just, you know, that's why I love creating this dialogue just to see. Oh, yeah, you know. it's awesome. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, like if you're really exploring something, there's something interesting to um, to making that happen. I mean, Fincher's famous for a hundred takes, um, but I've had people that have been on his sets and they say, he's not really directing him much. He's just making him do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again until you're not acting anymore. You're just talking because you're exhausted and you don't know what he wants. Um, but doing things different ways, I think there is a way that would be interesting to explore that way. Well, what if we did it like this? What if we did it like this? And all of a sudden something new comes out of that scene that wasn't there before. Um, I just I have never done it that way, but I think it's an interesting way. Uh, it's very interesting. You know, uh, one one technique I like to do is I actually on the last take I just let the actors. I say I'm not going to give you any direction, and I'm going to let you just whatever acting decision you want to make. That's what we're going to roll with, and just to see what they would come up with. And so, you know, and so that that and also makes the actors happy because now they're saying, "Oh, good, we get to have some you know some input on this scene." You yep. know, so uh, you know, <laughs> my you know that that's just what I've I've sort of learned over the years too. I don't know if it helps much, but, <laughs> but no, I think it's a great idea. I, I usually do that on the first take, where I'm like, "Well, let's see, let's see what you want to do. Let's go out, let's just try it. Let's see what it is, and see what they're doing, and then I'll gradually move them towards what is in my mind." influenced by what they did unless what they did was so brilliant which is what happened a lot with our with our poker guys and then in the end a lot of times i'll circle back around and say you want to try something different and let them do a different one and sometimes that changes the whole scene and then you go all right no i really like that take on it i hadn't thought of that before now let's go back and redo the wide shot and redo this and switch things around because it's so good um because you usually start conservative and then you get a little bit crazier as you go so it, it's all fun. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's always uh, you know I usually keep end up keeping like a journal of every day shooting and you know what I learned there and you know how to do all this stuff so that way it carries over well into you know your next projects when you're like you know looking through back over that stuff and you're like oh well I remember this stuff. You That's know? a great <laughs> idea. I've never done that. That's a really great idea. Oh, thank. <laughs> thank Especially you. as I get older and I can't remember stuff anymore as well as I used to. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad I was able to, you know, <laughs> give you that great idea. Um, 
you know, uh, so, you know, with Poker Night Now, you know, it's on iTunes. You know, could you sort of go through how you got, you know, dig- uh, digital distribution for it, you know, and why you chose iTunes and, uh, you know, uh, you know, is it coming to Netflix, stuff like that? Yeah, I'm sure it is. I, I didn't choose it. Um, the producer, uh, the producer did it. And, and actually, we were picked up uh, prior week. We were really close to being in South by Southwest last year. We were one of the finalists, and then I guess we were one of the last two cut, <laughs> and and that hurt. But we had a lot of interest in the film then, and Accelerator Media is the one that picked up the film right after that. And uh, they're an amazing company. They've done really well for us, as far as I would know. Um, they got us a lot of our online press and um, – they put it immediately on, I think on the 5th, it went on video on demand and on Amazon. And it didn't hit iTunes till a couple weeks after that. And we had a, a week run here in LA um, at a theater. And it's internationally, <laughs> well, there's streams in every language already. But it, it opened in Iraq, Iran, and Egypt. So it's like conquering the Middle East as we speak or at least it's playing in the Middle East. Um, but I get tweets from Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, a lot from England recently. And um, I think now that it's it's out there legally, uh, a lot more people are seeing it. But here you can get it iTunes, you can get it on uh, VOD, it's on Amazon. Um, and it should be coming to, I think it's coming out on DVD in February, and then probably right after that it'll hit Netflix. Oh, very cool. Because I'm actually uh, – I didn't know it was on Amazon, but I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes uh, if you want to check it out. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, because I, I had Jason Brubaker on who's like a, a, a digital distribution mastermind, and uh-huh. he's always talking about, you know, different ways and, you know, which – you know, th- there's really no correct answer for the right platform, so to speak. You know, right. so if you chose iTunes – you know, is there really a big difference between that and Amazon? Well, I mean, I don't know enough to comment, but I mean, really what I hear is basically the answer is not really because, you know, everyone's fighting over, you know, space. It's still, you know, uh, uh, you know, like there's a store window where, you know, yep. people would walk by. Well, now, you know, the front page of iTunes is that new store window where everyone wants to fight for retail space. Yep. So it, It's been a very interesting thing. And, and also, you know, just the distribution model is different. Like, uh, Accelerator had uh, somebody that was just getting lots of placement on different websites for articles or they did a lot of clips of the movie. In fact, at one point I was like, pretty soon we'll be able to see the whole movie just through clips. Um, but I, you would think, well, it's going to run. I don't know. Uh, who, who knows? What, I don't know what the digital model is, but maybe it's going to run like three weeks before the movie opens. And then once it opens, uh, it tapers off. But it was a lot longer tail where I'm still getting reports. I mean, they're still putting, getting reviews and websites that are talking about the movie. We just had an interview on Fangora go up yesterday, and it came out on Amazon and VOD on the 5th of December. And it wasn't until close to the 20th, I think, on iTunes. Um, so, you know, just getting it out there and getting it around it. I, it seems to be that their take is it's a lot longer window. You try and hit a lot more sites and, and you keep the publicity going because um, it, it can always drive somebody there. And it is, I think, in, in this climate, just getting anybody to even know about the movie is the hardest part, especially if you're not running you know, a 30-second ad every two minutes on TV. So just having anybody even know that it's out there, it takes a lot more time and energy. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, somebody once mentioned to me recently, um, it's not money that's in shortage now; it's it's, it's attention spans. Yeah. And uh, he, he said, you know, he he actually got money for his project, and he's like, you know, trying to get the word out there. It's like, you know, it's a very crowded marketplace. Yeah, it's very tough, and especially be, you know, uh, the line is so much more divided. What used to be, you know. A good, you know, two million to five million dollar film is a five hundred thousand dollar film now, and you're in the same ballpark as, you know, a thousand other films trying to get the same eyeballs and with no money, and so it's it's a difficult time to sort of step out and stand out from the pack, um, 
But it's also an amazing time because, you know, 10 years ago, none of those films would get made or very few of them just because it, it was cost prohibitive. And now there's so many more ways to get your film out there. Um, it's just we've got to find a good economic model to be able to sustain this this uh, new way of doing things. Yeah, you know, very true. And you, and you sort of see how it's sort of forming right now where basically everyone is getting their own uh, you know, the, all their own content on their own websites. Uh, you know, Netflix, HBO yep. Go. Um, they're sort of taking their things off Hulu and um, and Netflix, and just sort of saying, "Hey, we're going to just be here from now on, and you have to subscribe to us." Uh, and uh, you know, that's why now Netflix and Hulu are creating their own content, and pretty much everyone yep. now is looking for their own content. Even Amazon is looking for their own content now. Yeah, in fact, Ron's got a new series on Amazon that's really great. If you get a chance to see that. Oh sure. Uh, uh, which is that? It's called Hand of God. They just did the pilot, but I think that he's, I think that he's wrapped the series. So I don't know how many episodes. It's probably ten, um, and it'll it'll probably be February, March, maybe even later that it's going to come out. But the pilot's up on Amazon now. It's really good. Oh, okay, that's, I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. I think Titus Titus too. His Amazon series uh, Bosch uh, starts in February. Um, he's already wrapped that. So he's, he's got another one. So both those guys went immediately to, to, um, Amazon series right after the film, which is great. Um, it's giving good actors a lot of life and things that maybe they, I don't know if they, for whatever reason, they wouldn't say that they could carry a network show on a certain way. And these guys had the freedom to do this and make these characters their own. So they both really enjoyed it. And, and that's really cool, and, and it's also more opportunities for everybody too, because you know there's going to be more directors and somebody. I was at a meeting at the Writers Guild, and they were saying there were 300 over 300 drama series on TV last year. Over 300. That's just unprecedented. So there's a lot more opportunity, um, and I think that's sadly in some ways i think that's the direction independent film is moving to those people that sort of were in that sweet spot in the market are all gravitating towards tv yeah i i can definitely see that as well and and you know and also too um there's so many independent film channels now too which which just you know specialize in independent film and you know you go on there and you're like wow there's like a couple thousand choices of movies that have been made in you know in the past 5 years that are all independent yeah. films and it's just you know, you you don't have enough time to watch them all. You know, in a given time, because it's always getting new ones in there. So you know, it, it's it's very yeah, it's very interesting to see where this is all where it is all going to go, and you know, which eventually is going to become the new market model in both of terms of payment and distribution, and you know, and you know, and net neutrality too. You got to make sure that you know stays where it is, or else you know, it's all sort of for for nothing because if it if you know there's different you know levels of, of internet then you know some people who don't you can't afford the big stuff you know will you know get you can't you know, have trouble watching things online yeah there's a lot of uh big issues that are coming up mm -hmm. and and interesting issues and it's a you know you've been around this business for a long time too uh it, it's not like uh uh it's, it's so much more of a middle-class business than people think, at least for people in the tech side, from the writing, directing, producing, uh, even the acting side. There's the, you know, the 5%, 10% that are really ridiculously wealthy, and the rest of us are sort of grinding out our time because uh, we love this. Uh, I didn't get into this to become wealthy. I got into this because I love to tell stories, and I love working with people, and I love that collaboration. And I thank God that I'm able to pay my rent doing it. Um, but nobody's like uh, stockpiling millions and driving a BMW. You know, we're still all Honda Toyota guys trying to go to work each day and make enough money to pay your rent at the end of the month. Um, and mostly just because we do love this. This is I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I just feel very lucky and thankful and blessed each day uh, on whatever level of production you get to be involved in. It's it's a great way to make a living. It's a hard way to make a living. But man, it, it um, I can't imagine doing anything else. It's so much fun. Oh yeah, I completely agree. Uh, you know, it's like Ted Hope. He actually left independent filmmaking, and then now he's back. It's just a, it's an addiction. Yeah, it is an addiction. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, you know, Greg, I actually have a few uh, questions for people wrote in. If you don't mind, um, I'm, sure. I'll just pick like the best three. Um, the the first question is, uh, do you have to live in L.A. to become a screenwriter? Nope. 
especially not now. I think um, the caveat to that would be uh, it sure helps. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was in Indiana when Poker Night first uh, was in the trades uh, with the first uh, incarnation when we had Sam Jackson in. And suddenly I had agents for writing and I had, you know, 40, 50 meetings with all the different studios and all the little studios. And, um, I had to fly out every time. And then I had to do a lot of stuff on the phone. And so you go, uh, is it easier if you're here? It sure is easier if somebody calls your agent and says, Hey, that guy that wrote that thing that we read last week, can we get him in here today? And they're like, no, he doesn't live here. Um, but we could do a phone. They might be like, "Meh, we'll get somebody else in then. Um, so I think, but once you've made it, I don't know if it matters as much. Um, and the industry is getting smaller, but boy, it's hard to get that lightning in a bottle for that first script to get people interested and wanting to meet with you. And I think being out here helps. And especially, I mean, I wasn't here, so it was really, and probably you see the movie and you're like, well, that script shouldn't have gotten any attention. But, uh, I think for some of the scripts that aren't, a thousand percent great, but maybe they're only 80% great. It sure helps to know low level executives, the low level assistants, people that you can give your script to that'll read it and then push it up to their boss. And you don't get to do that unless you're out here. So I do think that there are advantages to it, but I would wait until the last possible second. I would get two or three scripts under your belt and then come out when you're ready, blow up the town and then you can get out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and um, you know, it's like what Quentin Tarantino said about you know making a first project. He said, "Oh, just make Reservoir Dogs." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had there was I went to one of the first things I went to out here was the guys that wrote Batman Forever, and they had written a script before that that was a brilliant script, but no one had seen Batman Forever yet, and everyone was asking, "Well, how do you do this? How do you do that?" And they kept going, "Just write a great script, and everything will happen for you." And I was so angry at the time. So I'm like, what does that mean? And how do you write a great script? And, you know, it's almost a blow off. And it also implies that they wrote all these great scripts and Batman Forever sucked. So I I was even angrier after I saw that. But I do think there's some I mean, there's some truth to once you have material that people want, uh, you're in a whole different place. You control a lot of things. Um, they have to come to you to get it at the same time, you know, if you write a great script, uh, shoot it. If you're in Indiana, if you're in Pennsylvania, if you're in Georgia, get friends together and do it, write something that you can do. And you come out here with a project that's good. You're in a whole different world and you're treated completely different than somebody that wants people to give you something or, that you want to give you a chance. You've, you've already taken that from them and you've given yourself permission and done it yourself. Um, and then, and then the world is different. Hopefully it's a good film and it's a good project, (laughs) but, um, it's hard. It's a, it's a hard game. And, uh, being out here, I think at the beginning anyway, making those contacts and, and working your way up is a good way to go. Although it's changing fast. Uh, you know, that kind of answers the second question as well, which was once I have a screenplay written and finalized, what should be my next step? Get everybody to read it, uh, anybody that you can, and have them tell you all the things that they hate and don't like and give it to people that will be honest with you. Um, I have I have a group of writers across the country from Virginia to the Midwest to out here that I've worked with over the years. and. Man, before we shot poker night, I I sent it to all of them again and they've read it over that 10 years. And I'm like, look, I'm about to shoot. Don't let me make an ass out of myself. Tell me what sucks because this is the last chance. And, um, I don't know if they did good enough job because there's still some problems, but you know, you, you have to cultivate those, those people. And then anyone that, you know, you just give it to them and and you keep trying to find somebody that's going to get it to somebody that means something. And I would say, while you've done that. You better be writing more. Don't don't think that this is the one that's going to do it because it's probably 99% chance that it won't. Um, you need to have more than one script, and they need to be getting better. 
and they need to see something. And then the truth is, is the way the business is now, unless you're making it yourself, uh, there wasn't anybody that I had a meeting with on poker night and it all starts the same way. Oh, we love the script. It's a great script. We have these projects. Would you be interested in this? It's, they don't want to make your movie. They want you to make their movie. So they're going to be offering you things that they have to see if you're right for that. So all of these things are just things to get you in a door, unless you're going to do it yourself. Um, but the only way to do that is to have two or three things, keep writing and, and develop a voice that people want to hear. It's a hard, hard road. I w and again, the, the other side of that is, um, I think I said it on Ashley's thing, which is, uh, I'm, I'm not the most talented writer. I'm not, uh, I have so many friends that are way better than me and way more deserving of, of getting attention for the writing than me. I think that I picked the right subject at the right time and did it in a way that was different enough that it caught people's attention. It wasn't writing about Martin Luther King or LBJ or, um, Game of Thrones. It was something that was very doable. It was very genre. Um, it was something that you could read it and see what it was going to be. It wasn't setting the world on fire. It was just sort of a, a very uh, popular genre that people were liking. And so it was more right place, right time than any great talent on my part. Um, so I think it's being open to all those things and trying to get better and, and, and then getting lucky. Sad to say, it has a lot to do with it too. Yeah, that, that is very true. Um, you know, luck does play an integral part in some of this, and um, and you know, it actually ties in with the, with the third question, which is, you know, should I crowdfund my project to show investors that there is real interest in the project? And I think what this person is saying is, if they crowdfund, they can then go to investors and be like, "See, we've already raised X amount of dollars. There is interest in this project. Can we get, you know, an actual, you know, private, uh, you know, private equity now?" Um, yes, I would say. Uh, when I came out to LA with Poker Night and a million dollars in the bank, uh, it was a lot easier to open the door for me than it was coming out to LA with Poker Night and no money in the bank. Um, when people feel like you're halfway there and you've already convinced some people that your project has worth, uh, it does make a difference. It made a huge difference. So yes, if you could crowdfund half your budget, a quarter of your budget, it certainly is a lot easier for an investor to come on when they're not the first one. The first one's the hardest, just like the cast. And I feel like once you say, I've already got $50,000 in the bank and I need 200000 it's a lot smaller road to get there. And you're already on that road where people feel like uh, we're getting on a train that's moving, not we're the one that's having to push the car. Um, so, yes, I would definitely say that's the case. Oh, very cool. As, why would I say that? I have no <laughs> idea. I'm saying it, uh, it seems like it would be the case. And it's got to put you – it sets you apart from the other people and put you further down the road. Um, but I say all this without great knowledge of that, and so take it as a caveat. But I'm just an idiot who got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's very good advice, Greg. Though, um, you know, I, I do think you made a really good point. And you know, if you do have money in an escrow account, and you know, say, hey, we're halfway there, or we're twenty percent there, or seventy percent there, it does car carry some cash with it. Um, yeah. You know, that way you can. You know, people are like, oh, this guy is serious, and you know, he is building towards something. And um, you know, um, you know, just you know. Uh, I know you have places to be, but before I just really, really quickly, I'll tell you a little story about um, we were. Uh, I was going to be part of a pitch fest, a producer's pitch fest, and we were going to invite wealthy investors who we knew to come talk to us, and um, it ended up falling apart. But um, you know, what I was doing was creating a very well thought out um, uh, pitch packet. And then mm -hmm. if they wanted to, they could just read the executive summary as soon as they opened it. And then everything else was like, you know, going to be all, all about our market aggregators, our social media plan, um, how to, you know, getting an email list. I mean, it was so in depth. And, you know, um, one person actually said to me, do you think that they're going to sit there and read all this? And I said, no, but they'll probably pass along to like their accountant or their money manager or somebody else who probably will read it. And you know that's that was my plan. Unfortunately, it never happened. Um, we ended up not having a pitch fest. So, um, and that was that was probably like, what, two years ago now. So uh, right now, I've just been you know writing scripts in the meantime. 
but yeah, that that's just sort of to tie in with everything we're talking. Oh yeah, about. it is. It was, that was actually even while you were talking to, I was thinking of there's there's a deal out here in LA that they'll do occasionally um, with post houses now, and I think part of it is because the post industry sort of upended a little bit in the last few years too, um, where post house will say to you'll have a script and they're getting into the producing business, so they'll say, well we'll give you post on this film. Let's say we're going to give you. Three hundred three hundred thousand dollars of services, but we'll only charge you fifty grand. So you can go to investors now and say you've got three hundred thousand dollars of investment in your movie against your million dollars by having us on board, and then you'll bring all the post here and pay us with what you make out of the film, and we'll be executive producers. So there are people that are putting deals together that way now too, um, but it 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 puts you on the road. Does that make sense? So I think it would be the same with crowdsourcing. Oh yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. So is it just like certain production houses that are doing that now or post houses? I've seen it with post houses oh, Okay, with a lot of them. And part of it is, you know, that also gives them work to keep their people going mm-hmm. and, and projects coming in. Um, and they're reaching out to, you know, more people on the lower end of the spectrum um, where, you know, they might be telling you it's a three hundred thousand dollar investment, but probably they're giving you a hundred thousand dollar investment that's over overpriced to three hundred. So, if you get money in, they get paid out first, and they get a bigger price than what it was. So, probably every tenth film that one of them finally makes money pays for the other nine. But it does give you a way to get started. Um, and so I've heard that going on out here, not as a scam. I don't think it's a scam, but I do think it's that sort of bonus of being first in and then looking out for themselves. Yeah. I actually, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a smart way to go. And I think equipment houses will do that too. You know, they'll work you a deal on, well, it's $200,000 of equipment. Uh, we'll give you that up. We'll give it to you up front, but you're going to pay us $80,000 against that. And then, uh, when your deferments come in, you'll pay us the rest. So you kind of piece it together piece by piece. Yeah, and that, that actually, you know, that would help a lot if two of equipment has to do that. So, I mean, and, and, you know, just thinking out loud, it'd be great if you actually, you know, could crowdfund something and get, you know, both a post house and a, uh, a, a, a um, storage house to actually do that for you. To actually, yeah. if they could actually join in together and you could get, you know, you know, six figures of, um, of services for, for, you know, whatever amount of money. That's excellent. And then you still have to come up with a way to pay your cast and your crew, but, <laughs> but the rest of it, it's a great way to get started. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, that, that's actually a good strategy. Cause I mean, if you did have that and then you could actually, you know, either crowdfund and then go through that to get a, um, like a producer to actually come on board or, you know, well-known direct cinematography and then, you know, try to, like you said, get you know, the first cast member to actually add importance to the project and sort of go from there. Yeah, I think it's a great, great way. In fact, truthfully, just like the script thing, any way that you can get money for your project is a great way. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an even better way if you can actually return money to your investors. That's the best way. But um, it's just it's – it's an interesting climate and an interesting time. And um, I think the more people are innovative about how they approach it, the more chances you have. Yeah, very true. And um, you know, I think we'll end up seeing more of those chances coming up now with everything changing as we were – just like as we were saying. Totally well. And I mean, again, this, if, if an idiot like me can do it, I mean, it took us 10 years to get it to this point. And you want to say, well, after 10 years, you hope it's really good. And I don't know if we got anything that was really good, but it's, it, it, it's good. Um, it, it's just, it's a long road and you want to go down it uh, with your eyes open and enjoy the experience. And some people are going to get really lucky. And in the first year, first six months, they might hit it. And all of a sudden they're making a movie. Other people, it might be longer than 10 years. But it's just know what you're getting into. Enjoy that process. And don't let anybody stop you and don't take no. Because if you want to make it, uh, you can do it. And I, I think I'm, I'm proof you don't have to be a genius or super talented. Um, you just have to really enjoy the ride and, and do your best. So 
And that, that is a great message. And, you know, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Greg. Um, uh, so Greg, uh, you know, where can people find you at online? Um, I'm, uh, on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Tumblr. I think that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, you also have an IMDB too. Which oh yeah, IMDB. <laughs> uh, I got my email if they want to bug me, I guess. Any of that's fine. And uh, where can they find Poker Nights at? Poker Night is on VOD. It's on Amazon. It's on iTunes. And in February, it'll be on Blu-ray DVD. Excellent. And I'm going to make sure to link to all those in the show notes. So if for, for those listening who want to actually purchase it, uh, rent it, uh, I, you can go to right to those links. Uh, I recommend you check it out. Um, you know, uh, I've seen the trailer. And, you know, from what I've talked uh, – from what I've heard from Greg and talked to Greg about, you know, uh, I, it, it sounds phenomenal and I want to check it out. I'm, I'm probably going to check it out tonight. I actually – literally this week has been like I've had no time to watch anything. Um, so that's why I haven't watched it. So I, I – but I promise, Greg, I will watch it. So <laughs> uh, Don't even worry. When you get a chance, uh, take a peek and then let me know what you think. All right. Will do. Uh, everyone, you can find me at DaveBullis.com and at Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. And by the way, if you like the show, please subscribe and, and post about it and everything else because, you know, uh, so I, there's a lot of people, Greg, who listen to the show who don't like, you know, uh, either subscribe or what have you. And uh, uh, I'm always, you know, pleading with people, please. It helps me parlay to get, you know, uh, guests or, you know, to because you know, they, they want to come on a good show. They don't want to come on a show. It's like, oh, they have no subscribers. They have no ratings. You know, what is this? Right. But um, so it's kind of like a movie. You have to attach, you know, <laughs> somebody to to add importance to it, you know. So um, but Greg, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, it, you know, I wish you the best poker night. And also I wish you best with you know whatever projects you're working on now um you know hopefully we'll see some uh something uh, another movie from you soon they can't can't say how much i appreciate it thanks so much for asking me on and i'm really impressed and excited for what you're doing and if anyone uh feels like they're wondering what kind of show it is look down the list of names that, that dave has on his show and it's quality quality people i don't know what i'm doing there with this list but uh, it, it's a great group. He's, he's doing uh, God's work for film. So uh, thanks for having me on, man. Oh, thank you so much for the kind words. I really appreciate that, Greg. Thanks, brother. Um, stay in touch. Bug me. If you need anything else, let me know. All right. Thank you very much. And have a great Saturday. All right. You too, Dave. Talk Take soon. care, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.